Great, thanks. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to talk about Google's algorithm. It's something uh, we sort of learn bit by bit about. And I discovered this morning going through Google's patents that there was a new one dealing with uh, representing entities in data sheets and building knowledge graph using questions and answers. I'm looking forward to actually getting to read those. I noticed the patents. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I use patents and how I do research. And there's one that deals with Google News that I'm going to talk about a lot. This is how I track changes in the SEO industry. It's how I look for new information. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. Looking for, uh, looking at Google publisher pages, looking at Google blog posts, listening to speakers like John Mueller. Uh, uh, there are good ways to do that to get an idea of what's going on. So there was a patent that came out in 2003. One of the inventors was Krishna Bharat, if, who, if you know anything about Google News, you know he was the head of Google News for a while and no longer is in that position, but he was the inventor of this patent. And when you update patents, you sometimes repeat everything that's in the descriptions of the patents and file new claims. So they're completely different and completely changed. And when a computer world writes about the new patents like they did in 2012 when a new version of this patent came out, they didn't know that. So they said it's exactly the same as the one from 2003. They didn't know the difference between them. So this first one has like 14 things in it uh, in the claim section that tell you this is what a news source, a news agency is, how they work, what's a good one. We're going to rank them, those higher. They have a number of international bureaus and cities around the world. They have high print subscription rates. These are things that really don't matter to digital publishers these days. So in 2015, they came out with a new version of this patent. In the claims, they said, we're going to look at links. And that's the only thing they said. That was the big change. We're no longer looking at how many international bureaus they have, how many entities they mention in a news article. Uh, we're just care caring about the links. Uh, so they have other patents. They have one that looks at how search results are clustered. And they cluster search results by topics. If you look in Google News, you'll see everything's arranged in topics. And they try to pick out representative stories that are possibly the best, the freshest, have the most updated content. And those are the ones that they'll pull out as important stories in those topics. Uh, so if you want to uh, be the source for a topic, you make sure yours stands out in some way. <laughs> Uh, you maybe mention more entities than other people because it shows a breadth of knowledge, of uh, uh, awareness of local intent that other people may not be showing. But these are covered in a different patent than the original one that came out before in 2003. This one actually came out in 2002 using clustering, but it was rewritten uh, in 2016 to talk about things like freshness. Uh, so I find there are certain ways with patents to tell whether or not they have valuable hints about what Google's doing. One of them is looking at these continuation patents where they update the claims because the claims reflect the processes that they use to, to uh, find new things to talk about, new ways to uh, find importance amongst the stories that they'll show in search results. Uh, another thing I look at is who wrote it. And I'll look the authors, the inventors up in LinkedIn. Uh, if I see somebody like Anna Patterson from Google, who is a, was a vice president of search at Google after she tried to destroy Google with a search engine called Cool. It failed. Uh, she stopped working for them. Two weeks later, she was back at Google as the vice president of search. They like her a little bit. 
so these continuation patents are helpful. Uh, they sometimes also publish that a long list of related patents. They have some on something called phrase-based indexing. It's something not a lot of people in the uh, search marketing community talk about. There have been over 20 related patents to the phrase-based indexing patents, which shows me that Google's put a lot of work into this phrase-based indexing approach. They've come out with white papers on semantic topic modeling, where they talk about co-occurring words being used in pages that rank highly for the same subject, which means that they're related to each other. They use a lot of the same phrases as headings, as titles, and so on. And, and the fact that they're all related says, these are important. These have value. Uh, they're, it's like evidence. In a courtroom, when people build cases to try to prove something, they build it brick by brick. They don't throw the whole thing at you. They give you little bit by little bit. And if you do the same thing with patents, with uh, what the search engines are doing, uh, you tend to learn a lot. Uh, I'm interested in digging through those two patents I found this morning about uh, knowledge-based, uh, entity-based uh, information, because the person who wrote that patent also wrote one about knowledge cards and what information shows up in them uh, a year ago or so. And she's been right in uh, how the topic determines what appears in those knowledge cards. So I'm interested in seeing what she says about these entity information sheets and what information they collect about entities. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've uh, talked about a lot about uh, entities, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, a bit about optimizing for entities in this presentation. If you're not using schema markup, it's one way, something you should be doing. There's new schema that gets introduced on a regular basis. There's one called speakable, which is how you mark up answers that people might ask questions to a speaker. And it'll determine whether or not that's the thing it reads to people in answering those questions. There are uh, things you can optimize uh, for when you write answers that get spoken. Like prosody is a way of determining where uh, pauses might take place in your answers. Uh, or whether you, or not you emphasize certain words. Uh, and Google does some machine learning automating that. But if you're not using JSON-LD on your pages to mark up schema, uh, something that some sites weren't doing, like Wikipedia would write all these articles about entities, but they didn't have schema saying, these are the entities, this is the main entity of this page. And it's something they should be doing because it's like a, a search engine, search engineers way to optimize content. We're, we're telling you what the page is about in machine readable uh, language so that uh, we can actually search for uh, uh, schema markup first instead of the web. Uh, if somebody asks, what is the movie that Robert Duvall said, I love the smell of napalm in the morning? Google can do a search for schema and say, OK, movies Robert Duvall stars in this famous quote. What movie is it? Okay, and the search result are, the top result are two uh, YouTube entities with Robert Duvall selling, saying, I love, love the smell of napalm in the morning. So if you optimize using schema, you're uh, taking advantage of a database of information that Google will search for before it searches through the index of web content, which is maybe something Google spokespeople aren't telling you these days, but it happens, it exists. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the concept of a machine ID, when Google came out with, uh, they acquired MetaWeb. They acquired a, a, a database from it called Freebase. And Freebase used to uh, 
give machine IDs to different entities. So Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't just the Terminator or kindergarten cop, he was a long string of letters and numbers. Uh, so every time they had an article about Arnold Schwarzenegger, they could mark it with that long string of letters and numbers, and that would tell the search engine, this is about Arnold Schwarzenegger, the entity. Uh, and they started using those entity IDs in places like Google Trends and in reverse image search to uh, mark up the specific entities things were about. It was like search engineers' version of SEO. Uh, so I have some examples in this presentation of places where they talk about main entities of pages. So you may have a page that has a bunch of entities on it, and you want to identify which entity is the one the page is about specifically. So I had a client with an a apartment website. It was four pages long. They didn't include lots of information. It was just outside of Washington, D.C. And the elevator in, in, that goes down to its basement went down to the Washington Metro with lots of shops and stores, the biggest shopping center in Virginia area. Uh, it was called Pentagon City, and there were lots of uh, headquarters of places like Lockheed Martin that were accessible through that, uh, uh, which may, would make the commute from uh, around Washington, D.C. a lot easier if you could just ride the metro. If you had kids and lived in those apartments, you could visit 19 different Smithsonian's for free and it's your Saturday morning. You know, knowing that location really does sell and it really does make a difference. And we helped this apartment complex add entities and optimize for entities to their website and let people know about all the things that were related to it. And they sold out of all their apartments like really quickly because people wanted to live there. They understood the value of uh, being that close and being tied to something like uh, uh, the Washington Metro line, which was just an elevator right away. Uh, so there was a new Doctor Who episode. There's a new Doctor Who. She's female. Uh, that seemed to be a big buzz, and uh, they made sure when they uh, when people were writing about the new Doctor Who, uh, they included entity information about Jodie Whittaker. Uh, and uh, it got, I watched it, it was a pretty good episode. Uh, but make sure you uh, mark up entities when you're writing about them. Understand who they are, uh, refer to them uh, in your schema markup because like I said, search engine will search through schema before it searches through a web index of text. Uh, do any of you have speakers? Do you ask Google questions? Like I ask for news in the morning when I wake up and sometimes it'll, it'll say, I have two more stories, I'll email them to you. Do you want them emailed to you, yes or no? And I say yes and uh, so it, it keeps me busy during the day and getting answers from Google when I uh, ask good questions and I think about them and ask them a lot. Uh, but deciding what it should answer is something that as a web publisher you can do with this new schema markup. If you decide this is the answer I want to use and one thing I would recommend is that you start talking, start speaking what your answers are and see how well they come out as something that's spoken. Because there is something that's called pros prosody, which is how a search engine, there, there's a white paper I've linked to at the bottom of this page where Google talks about uh, how they do machine learning to decide where to insert hyphens, where to you know, talk about add emphasis. Uh, so, you know, with a statement like good night and night parting in such sweet sorrow that I shall good night till be tomorrow, be morrow. Uh, it makes all the difference where you put the emphasis. When you have something like iambic pentameter uh, and peop 
people on stage, or you've got a speaker saying this stuff. Uh, there is a comedian from the United States. His name was Stephen Wright. He did everything in a deadpan. He would say things like, I have a full-scale map of the United States. I keep it folded in my backyard. Now, the lack of emphasis can make things funny. If you're not careful and you're a news publisher and you uh, don't plan ahead for uh, accents and emphasis and so on, it may turn out funny too. You don't want that. So I've uh, come across a couple things I've added here as some sources of additional information that I thought were worth reading. There was a really good uh, paper, a uh, booklet actually. The top one is a booklet about entity search, uh, entity recognition, how Google recognizes entities and associates them using like Google Trends and so on. Uh, Google sees a query, it searches through the query for entities it may see in that query and it associates lots of things with that. It may include pictures. If you uh, have a new Android phone with Google Photos, there's a, a, a program called Google Lens, which allows you to do searches by photograph. And that's tied to schema markup. So if you have a website for a band and you've added event markup in schema, for the band, Google may show the, that event to somebody who does a search for the band by photograph. When they do object recognition and say, oh, that's the band so-and-so, we have schema markup involving that band. This person who searched for them may want to buy tickets to go see them. So show that to them. So learn about entities and how Google recognizes them. Uh, It'll, it'll help uh, you show up in search results. It'll help you show up in trends. Uh, Google does show in the news type results uh, at the tops of ser web searches. So if you're talking about an entity that uh, people are searching for, you may be there. It's a good place to show up. Uh, there was a white paper about uh, search by voice from Google. Uh, they talked about Goog 411. I remember going to a concert, uh, to a conference in 2006. A friend of mine pulls out his phone and uh, starts speaking to Goog 411 uh, about finding a restaurant for breakfast in New York City. And I'm wondering, why is he doing that? <laughs> he found us a place. Yeah, it was good. Uh, so they did that for a period of about four years or so for free to get lots of people talking to them, asking for businesses. And they learned about how people speak. Uh, and that white paper talks about some of the things that they've learned. Uh, the last one is by someone who worked for Google for a few years in their uh, knowledge uh, graph and knowledge vault programs. Zin Luna Dong, who now works for Amazon, building a product graph. Okay, but uh, she came up with something called trust, uh, web-based trust, where she came up with a thousand uh, facts, and she checked websites to see how many of them they get correct, and she found things like the some of the top gossip websites, like a Gawker were amongst the top 50% in terms of page rank and the bottom 50% in terms of knowledge base trust, which shows you that maybe page rank isn't the most trusted uh, metric to use to rank web pages. And that's all I have for you. But I look forward to questions. Thank you.